Right. Okay, I will admit them right now. Okay. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever in the world you may be. Uh, my name is Janet Rosbach, and I'm the Director of Alumni Relations and Volunteer Engagement at Baruch College. And I am so delighted to welcome you all to our view from abroad uh, from China. Uh, the idea for this series, um, this is a third in the series. Uh, we've had conversations with alumni in Israel and the United Kingdom to date. Uh, was that uh, back in April, when uh, things were really bad in New York City, uh, my colleagues and I were wondering how our alumni were managing around the world. And so we thought we would ask them. And uh, we are so fortunate today uh, to have uh, five alumni with us um, from, uh, from China and, uh, uh, and with uh, history working uh, in, uh, uh, in China, joining us um, for a very candid conversation about what they see out their window uh, in terms of uh, their, uh, in terms of COVID-19, their personal experiences, uh, and um, I'm sure it's going to be a fascinating conversation. A few administrative details. Um, if you will kindly mute yourself and stop video so that we can focus uh, primarily on uh, our speakers today, uh, that would be terrific. And we uh, will uh, invite you to put any questions you have to our speakers in the chat, which is in the bottom of your screen. And we will, uh, when we get to q and I will uh, ask those questions uh, to our panelists. So uh, with that in mind, I am going to pass the floor to our wonderful moderator, Steve Russolillo. Uh, I hope I said that right, uh, from the Wall Street Journal, a Baruch alumnus um, and a great guy. Uh, so Steve, the floor is yours. Janet, thanks so much. And uh, it's great to be here. Thanks so much for having me. Uh, we have, I think, about 50 people so far. Uh, so it's it's nice to see that we have a, a pretty good crowd for what should be a great conversation. Uh, I am a, as Janet said, I am an editor at the Wall Street Journal. And I lived in Hong Kong for the past three years, just moved back to the, U the US uh, in early February. Um, but when I was in Hong Kong, I was a markets and finance reporter uh, covering covering equities, IPOs, and also uh, cryptocurrency, which was uh, a lot of fun, especially during the Bitcoin boom in uh, 2017. So, um, so yeah, uh, but now I want to sort of, uh, we're going to introduce a lot of the, the guest speakers that we have here, and then we'll have uh, what should be a great conversation about just living in a pandemic and what it's like, uh, particularly from the view in China and Hong Kong. So uh, I'd love to turn it over. We'll have each participant, um, e each speaker, maybe take a few minutes or so and just kind of uh, give a little introduction about themselves, what you're doing, where are you, uh, and we'll go from there. So uh, Ben, I'd love to start with you. Me? Yep, you, Ben. Oh, great. Thank you. Uh, I'm Ben, Benjamin Ding. I'm 98 MBA. And a 2000, 2003 uh, Master of Science in Quantitative research, uh, Modeling and Method. Um, so two masters from Baruch. Um, and I, I, my home was in New York, but we moved to Hong Kong in 2007. We, uh, we lived in Hong Kong uh, till today. Actually, I am at my Hong Kong home uh, in my fourth quarantine. I had three, one, three quarantines before uh, when I was traveling back and forth between Shanghai and Hong Kong. So each time I had to be put, put under a, a house arrest for a, a, a number of days. Then uh, I was in Shanghai for two months before I came, I came back to Hong Kong this time. So uh, this is my first week. I'm going to have my second week. I currently, uh, I used to work in New York for AIG. And then in 2007, I moved, the company sent me to Hong Kong, and then I worked for AIA, which was AIG's 
um, uh, subsidiary and then went public in 2010. Then I was the, uh, back then I was the head of market risk for their regional businesses. Then by 2018 in September, I left the AIA after 18 years with AIG plus AIA. I joined this Chinese company. It's called China Pacific Insurance Group. Uh, this is a insurance company that is uh, of similar size to AIA and also similar in many aspects, including culture and, uh, and, uh, and the, the uh, business strategies. So uh, I'm the group chief investment officer uh, for that uh, company uh, in charge really overseeing the investments for uh, uh, life insurance, uh, property casualty insurance, asset management, retirement pension businesses. Um, yeah, some, you know, just to quickly share some great news that we, uh, CPIC went public on the th for the third time, uh, this time in London uh, on June 17th. So CPIC became the first insurance company listed in Shanghai, Hong Kong, and uh, London. So yeah, so uh, life has been pretty good, uh, albeit I was put in, uh, in, you know, locked in a room in a house and in a, once in a room, small, tiny room in a hotel in Shanghai. But uh, other than that, has been, uh, it's been a great journey for me. I'm still very happy with what I'm doing. Uh, thank you. That's great, Ben. Thank you. Uh, I'd love to turn it over to Leslie. Oh, hello, everyone. I'm Leslie Wang, and um, I'm mostly in Hong Kong right now in my office. So I'm a, um, actually a financial person and entrepreneur. Um, I went to Baruch um, in 2001, and I graduated with the uh, full-time honors MBA major in finance. Um, after that, uh, I got the opportunity to work for Goldman Sachs in New York for a number of years. And I had a great time and asked for relocation back in Asia. So I came to Hong Kong 2005. Um, also had a wonderful time, a very different culture in Hong Kong office. Then after financial crisis, I went to work for another financial um, major firm, so Morgan Stanley in Singapore for another two years. Had a great run. Uh, at that moment, I was the uh, global head for risk for the listed derivatives, so futures and options, um, uh, operations and services. So I had a wonderful, I, I felt that I was motivated at that time and I felt we had a great life. But then something um, unexpected happened. That's how it changed my life forever or changed our family's life forever. So on the family business trip in Europe, um, it was a traumatic accident that I actually lost our only child for 15 minutes. So that 15 minutes, it, it was something as a parent, I, I'm sure most of you would never wanted to experience. Fortunately, she was to return back to us. But that 15 minutes uh, after that, on the, on the journey back to Singapore, had a lot of self-reflection. What should I do with my life? And what I can do to bring tangible result or visible impact to the, not only the society, but starting from my child, only child, that I never had a really a, a good um, time to spend with her growing up. So actually that's the, that's the first reason I left the financial career to pursue something different. And then there's another thing happened that uh, um, actually my daughter, Sophia, and my husband and I, we wrote a storybook together. It was my daughter's creation um, in memory of the vi young victims of the Sandy Hook shooting events and those uh, children uh, a few years ago. So that was the experience that she gave us a lot of inspiration and we added the book to the school. It was the inspiration that we want to do something better and create a better world. And uh, me, myself, I was born in Shanghai and I had Farouk um, give me the wonderful education and change my life and change my career perspective. So I think I myself is a, a classic product of the best leading education resources who create my opportunity, uh, my opportunity for today. So we decided to actually uh, set up a platform to share the story of how family can collaborate and how we can mobilize some of the best resources to help our children next generation to grow up and have a holistic 
development resources and some of the worst reading contents and services. So that's why now I'm today as a founder and the startup owner of a, a global online platform for children and parents. It's called mommydaddyme.com. So we are the platform to connect children and parents across multiple markets, um, as well as uh, we provide edu tech solutions. So we're based in Hong Kong, but our markets cover in mainland China, uh, Hong Kong, of course, and in Bangladesh, Philippines, uh, Indonesia, and uh, we also have a small office in New York. So we're fortunate to call some of the um, world's leading institutions as our partners. So in Hong Kong, we work with uh, Scholastic, um, the world's uh, uh, publisher, the largest children book publisher, um, and the South China Morning Post, um, pilot reading and learning programs for Hong Kong children. In mainland market, uh, starting last summer, so Ben was working uh, as a, one of the uh, senior executive at the major insurance, and we also collaborate with another insurance company called China Taipei Insurance. We are the education uh, contents provider for the mainland users. And uh, in Philippines and in um, Bangladesh, we have a strong presence where we actually collaborate with the locals and major telecom to mobilize the, uh, the leading education contents and our live tutorial services uh, to benefit the mass market. So our Mommy, Daddy, Me actually carry a uh, learning brand called Spread Academy. So Spread's mission is to really utilize the scalable modern technology in an old traditional fashion way. What is that? It's using the real teacher and educators around the world to accomplish our mission. We have two missions. Number one is bring equitable access of quality education, disregard where the, the um, location of financial capability is. So that's why our B2B2C distribution model give us the, the opportunity to serve all. And number two, for high achieving um, parents and their children, if they want to get some of the, uh, the best resources they can, which we are also working with uh, for some, some leading university in the US to customize the program for US underserved as well as the rest of the Asian markets. So it's a long introduction. I hope uh, that uh, um, I, can, I can share that with you. Now, in terms of a pandemic, we're doing something very unique. We're doing actually a global online journey. It's a summer camp that introduced the, since now we cannot travel, we're isolated in our own cities and countries. We actually bring the word to the teams and the youth where we have a live um, broadcasting um, events and the classes from our cultural ambassador from 14 major cities, from London, New York, Paris, Sydney, Tokyo, Shanghai, Beijing. They're going to do a uh, twice a session a day to, to bring the food, history, culture, all the knowledge about people, language from the major city to highlight to our children who, who cannot travel. So hopefully you will see us soon on that program. Thank you very much. That's really fascinating, Leslie. Thank you. Uh, Jane, I'd love to pass it over to you, just a, a quick intro, and then um, and we can go from there. Thanks, Steve. Hi, my name is Jane. I'm a partner from uh, PwC PricewaterhouseCoopers in China. I uh, took my major of accounting from Baruch College many years ago, uh, which is the strongest, one of the strongest major from Baruch accounting. And I also, after I graduated, I also took my MBA in taxation um, from Baruch as well. That's why, you know, starting from then, I'm uh, in the taxation field uh, for the past 20 years. Um, I started my career in New York, uh, which is where Baruch located, uh, with one of the big six firm at that time, Arthur Anderson. Um, and I moved to Hong Kong in early 2000, uh, which eventually I joined PwC at that time because of the, you know, the Aaron, uh, Aaron uh, crisis. Uh, um, Arthur Anderson's uh, offices in China merged with PwC at that time. So um, I worked with, uh, I worked with PwC since then in Hong Kong. And starting 2010, I moved to Shanghai. This is where I'm uh, currently located. I moved to Shanghai for, it's been 10 years already. Um, having been living to, uh, in you know, three largest city of the world, New York, Hong Kong, and Shanghai, uh, you realize the world is 
flat. And there are things moving on, but it's people are connected to each other. But however, because of this pandemic, uh, we seem to be uh, quarantining our current location. There's limited amount of travel. You know, if we want to travel, we can be just like Ben, quarantining at home for at least 14 days. So currently our joke is from Shenzhen to Hong Kong, it's 28 days. So there's a lot of restrictions among uh, global traveling, but we do see there's a, a booming travel within China. There's a, there's a lot of traveling happening because I went to Shenzhen this Monday. The, the airport is packed, the airlines, the flights are packed. So, you know, maybe later on I, we can share a little bit more about what's, uh, what's happening in China. Back to you, Steve. Yeah, that would be great, Jane. Thank you. And uh, finally, we'll, we'll just get a quick intro here from Dion. Uh, Dion, how are you? Good. Thanks, Steve. Um, so I'll, I'll try to keep it short. My, uh, so I took a lot of detours in my career, made a lot of stops. Uh, I graduated from Baruch in 2008. Before I graduated, I joined the U.S. Army uh, in 2001, right after September 11th. I was in Iraq from 2004 to 2006 uh, with the 42nd Infantry. Uh, when I came back, I finished my degree. Uh, went to Hong Kong for uh, investment banking uh, with the Deutsche, with, uh, with Deutsche Bank. Um, did about a year there. Uh, joined Goldman for two more years in, in the in the banking division. Uh, after banking, uh, joined the Bing Capital. Uh, did private equity for uh, two plus years, and then I left Bing in 2014, uh, 2014 uh, and founded my own consulting company. Uh, right now, uh, our focus is uh, Expert Network. Uh, we are, I think, the third largest Expert Network service provider here in China. Uh, and we also provide IPO-focused uh, market research uh, for Chinese companies that are looking to get listed uh, in Hong Kong, uh, the U.S., uh, and uh, domestically. Um, some of our, uh, I think, more recent deals uh, you might have heard of uh, Li Xiang Auto, uh, which is the, currently the largest GHEV automaker here in China. Um, also, uh, Beikhe, uh, housing, I think, the largest uh, housing transaction platform uh, here, here based out of China. Um, yeah, I think that's about it. Uh, so, sorry. Uh, um, so we have offices in uh, Beijing, Shanghai, and Hong Kong. Uh, I was living in Beijing uh, right before the pandemic started. Uh, I, uh, you know, I was in Sanya when the pandemic happened, and then uh, I decided not to go back to Beijing and moved to Nanjing instead. Uh, Nanjing is currently the safest city uh, in China. Uh, I don't, I don't think there's been any death uh, here in Nanjing. Actually, in the entire Jiangsu province, there hasn't been any uh, uh, death related to COVID. Um, so, but people here are still pretty careful. Uh, we still go out and wear masks. Uh, so yeah, that's, uh, that's about it. Yeah, Dion, Thanks. I want to pick up on that point right there. Why, yeah. why do you think that it's been the safest region in China where you are now? Like, what, what, I really have no idea. Happened? I think it's... Uh, it, you know, luck definitely you know plays a part. I think uh, Ben mentioned some some ninety year old passed away uh, in Hong Kong. We uh, we have a neighbor, uh, you know, the next building. Um, she's about ninety three when she got sent to the hospital. She came back, <laughs> so I was I was uh, you know I was really shocked. Uh, but you know, good for her, good for her. Uh, so um, I, I think uh, you know definitely healthcare system has to play a part. Nanjing has some of the best hospitals here in China. Um, and, you know, whatever they did to control sort of population flow um, to make sure, you know, you don't, you don't get overrun, um, you know, at the hospitals, uh, that definitely, you know, played a part. Um, so, yeah, so, you know, having, having sufficient healthcare service uh, is definitely key. Yeah, I think the, the, the key part is the social distancing and, the, and mask wearing. Uh, sure. Wearing a mask in, in China is almost like a social responsibility to others, not to, to, to the person himself. And I had a, I was in a barber shop. Uh, the guy, I was asking the guy, he was from Jiangsu province. He said in his village, there was nobody who got sick because once that quarantine or lockdown started, the whole village started refusing any uh, strangers to come in. 
And uh, so they, they had checkpoints on the road. And so it's like, you know, defending themselves. But then they said, okay, I'm not going to go out to cause trouble to others, but I don't let other people cause trouble to our villages. So that's what the mentality has been. And Jane, you mentioned something interesting. You said that travel has picked up quite a bit within China. Uh, I, I'm curious in your day to day and how you're traveling, like what are some of the best practices you're seeing from people as they're traveling? Why, why do I guess people feel comfortable now to travel? I mean, what, what are your thoughts and views on just traveling right now, especially within China? Well, if you look at the traffic in Shanghai, we start to have traffic congestions, which is when during the pandemic year, you know, period, uh, there's almost, there's nobody on the street. But after uh, around April, starting around April, the traffic start to pick up. And nowadays, every single day, we have traffic congestions. So this is a signal that uh, you, you see the business start to boom. And if you, you know, there's more and more people traveling within China uh, because of the restriction of travel outside of China. So they, it boosts up the traveling business, uh, the holiday businesses in China. Like a lot of our, my colleagues, they are, they are taking their vacation time with their children to uh, Yunnan, which is a beautiful place. There is also a lot of resort area in China that's, that's actually amazing places. And, and we start to see people, you know, traveling around. But my experiences was, I went to Shenzhen. It's, it has the biggest, largest airport. And you see people packed there. Um, which is amazing. Um, so you, you see, but a, a lot of people, as you know, Dion or, or Ben mentioned, uh, most people were still wearing masks, trying to keep social distance. But the good thing is uh, wearing masks is not preventing people from communications or from, you know, you know really distinct from your behaviors, but it is a safeguard uh, in China as well. Um, but but you, you can see it's a sign, it's a signal that economy is picking up. And Ben, you mentioned that you are in your fourth quarantine right now. Uh, and so when most of the world is kind of sheltered in place and stayed home, it seems like you're still traveling. It, ha it hasn't really stopped you. What's, what's prompted this uh, continued travel back and forth where you're going and what you're doing? And, uh, yeah. and how, are you, so I, how are you handling a fourth quarantine? <laughs> The thing is, I work in Shanghai alone, and my home, my home is in Hong Kong. So I can't stay away from my home for too long. Then uh, when, I, when I'm in ha Shanghai, I work very hard, like uh, for 15 hours a day, because I don't have much fun just all by myself. Then using my, uh, my apartment like a dorm and uh, spending most of the time in office. So once I can get my, my projects uh, squared away, uh, then I, I figured, you know, it's um, it's time for me to return to home and work from out of Hong Kong for, for a while before I come go back to Shanghai again. Uh, before the, the the pandemic, I used to travel on a weekly basis. Uh, so every weekend, I'm 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 at home and I, I may spend a little bit of time in Hong Kong, working out of my Hong Kong office. But then this time it's been a, a, a long uh, time slot, like a month in Shanghai, a month in Hong Kong. But overall speaking, I can't miss my family for too long, so I have to come back. This time I came back for, for, the, uh, for this fourth quarantine. Um, it was uh, a, a counter-human a counter human flow because most of, a lot of people were flying or running out of Hong Kong to Shenzhen because Shenzhen is considered a safer place. And so on my way back to Hong Kong, the custom is pretty empty. Uh, the, uh, medical, the medics, the medical service people, were like many times more than the, the travelers. But the, I flew from Shanghai to Shenzhen, like what Jane said, uh, the flight was packed and the, the, whole, uh, the whole business class was, was like full of people. Um, but I, I don't think, I don't see people are so much concerned inside China today. Yeah. That's fascinating. And Leslie, I'll turn it over to you. Uh, obviously with schools around the world being closed and, and everybody shifting to remote learning. I mean, it seems like this is your moment now for your company. I mean, how are you, how uh, are, are you, I hate to use the word benefiting, but are, are you benefiting now from everyone moving to remote learning or how, how has the, how have the conditions changed uh, for you and your startup? 
Thank you for the question, Shep. And then as uh, Steve, as you said, um, we see increased opportunities around different markets. That's a better um, way to put it than, than benefiting. Yeah. Yes, <laughs> even if, um, I think I think the world has changed uh, dramatically, and I think probably in the near term, it's not going to ever return to what we have uh, um, lived and enjoyed in terms of globalization. Um, and I think like Ben, like Jane, Steve, Jeanette, and Dion, uh, we are the world travelers. We consider ourselves global citizens. And we are, I mean, my husband and I, we are some top, top tier, probably a flyer of Catholic Pacific. But we couldn't do now. And I think now, um, in a way, it is, uh, it, I think it's, the world is uh, reshuffling. And in terms of education, it's more so. And we heard these days a lot, the words called new normal. So even before the pandemic, actually, uh, we are the fortunate um, early users of Zoom, uh, even beginning of last summer. So we had our API all connected. So we have a, a lesson booking flow. So it's all infrastructure set up to serve as alternative to, to the traditional way of education. Now, online education, distant learning with the live teachers in the classroom like this um, has been quite leading, I would say, practice in China itself, but not to the rest of the world. Hong Kong has been a traditional offline tutoring center model, and in the U.S., pretty much so. And not to mention somewhere that we have the disparity of the, or the, the, the lack of access to the internet or to the good uh, teachers. In, in Southeast Asia or South Asia. So yes, we see the volume pick up. We see the partners that used to be a little bit uh, indifferent to our proposal in the past, become much eager to actually come to us. And that brings us some more uh, access. And we are now actually, uh, we still relatively a smaller team, but uh, we are growing rapidly by teaming up with uh, South China Morning Post in Hong Kong, and we are going to work with uh, a Northwestern Center of Talent Development to customize some of the uh, learning program remotely uh, to benefit our uh, Asian users. And in the U.S. itself, we are actually now in the part, uh, process of uh, piloting a program for the reading for under uh, resource um, communities. So this is something we hope we can go get back to the community that uh, use the technology and use the accumulated resources we have a build last year to prepare for this so-called transformational year. And this is the, um, we, we said actually the crisis, we, uh, we wish that would be turned out different, but I think a human race is always very innovative and very creative. We have the commitment to make things better. And so I think increased opportunity and number two, make us act faster and innovate faster. Like the global online camp, we said that we bring the word live to you is the is there something that just came out the last one or two months that we think how to help um, our, our other users? Yeah. Great, thank you, Leslie. And Dion, I wanna turn it over to you. Uh, obviously, you know, you're involved in IPO advisory and market research and uh, the markets after, you know, quite a huge fall earlier this year, uh, once the pandemic started, have really come back with a vengeance here. And so I'm curious what you're seeing now on the IPO front, on the markets front, um, and you know what, where do you think goes things go from here? Yeah, um, obviously U.S. IPO volume this year has gone down. I think about thirty to forty percent, so that's affected our business. And also, I think domestic uh, stock exchange also has been uh, doing a lot, of introducing new you know markets, etc. Um, you know, ha having asking a lot of companies to come, basically come back and, and list domestically. So um, that's affected us a little bit because we were, uh, I guess, US and Hong Kong focused uh, previously. Um, but we addressed it, you know, like Leslie said, you know, you have to adapt, you have to transform. Um, so we, we've definitely, uh, uh, you know, we're trying to learn uh, the, the domestic regulations, uh, you know, uh, you know uh, learn with, uh, I guess, alongside with the brokers, uh, understand you know what they what they what they need what they require um, understand the regulation here obviously um, and you, you know if you if you look at the IPO process uh, traditionally uh, I mean when I was doing banking we, we, we everything has to be on site almost you know you have to 
wine and dine the client. Uh, you have to meet them in person. You got to talk through things in, in, in large meetings. Um, and, 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 you know, talk about road shows. You have to go on the, you know, go on, go on the road for two weeks. Um, this year we've done, I think, four deals without having a in-person drafting session, which is unheard of. Uh, you know, back in the days, regardless where you are, uh, you can be in Hong Kong, Shanghai, Beijing, uh, wherever, but everyone will come together uh, for a week uh, before fouling. Um, but that, that didn't happen this year. We, we were using Zoom, we we're using uh, Tencent, uh, you know, uh, we're using, you know, different, different, different video conference uh, uh, apps. Um, everything was done remotely. Um, that's never happened before. Uh, and we got it done, you know. And, um, will this be a trend going forward? I mean, obviously, this saves a lot of time and, 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 and cost. Um, but will this continue? I, I, I don't know. Uh, because uh, I, think, I think investors, they still prefer to meet people face-to-face. -face. Um, obviously, there, there are times where there are technical difficulties, which, you know, uh, impact the process negatively. Um, so that's, you know. Uh, but yeah, but I, I think there will be a good mix of technology going forward uh, where, um, you know, if it's not feasible to meet face to face, people are just more open to do it remotely. We, I even pitched, I don't know, I, I think about a dozen times this year remotely without meeting the company at all, we signed contracts. So, <laughs> so that's never happened to me before either. So um, yeah, a lot of changes this year. And how did those pitches, how, how did they go? I mean, how, what did you do differently? Like, you know, being on a Zoom camera as opposed to being in person? I mean, I assume it's, it's quite different. It's more difficult to gauge their, um, to really see the expression and their reaction. Uh, and uh, yeah, it's different. It's different. You, you almost have to prepare a speech um, because a lot of times it's just not very interactive. I mean, yeah, but you know, supposedly there shouldn't be any issues, right? But then when you're in a, in a meeting room, uh, you know, when you're looking at seven people on a small screen, uh, you don't really know which face to sort of focus on, right? And uh, some people are playing on their phone, some are looking down, some are looking up, some are thinking, like it, it gets a little more difficult. Um, but you know, you, you, sort of, you sort of get through it. Um, Share screen helps, right? Being able to uh, share screen and, and, and put on the PPT, uh, that's, you know, and, and, you know, whether it's Zoom or Tengxun, um, they, they, their app is great. Um, very little lag time. Um, so that's, that's very helpful. Um, so for, for the IPO business, I, th I think, you know, um, we should wait and see to see how that impacts the business. Uh, for our expert network, um, I have to say, um, Traditionally in China, um, investment firms, hedge funds, local hedge funds are not very fundamental driven. Um, you know, you, you basically, it's very policy driven in a way, very timing driven. Um, but uh, this year we've seen about a 70% increase in terms of usage. Um, I think that has to do with people not being able to travel, um, but it also has a lot to do with, um, you know, we have some scandals recently, <laughs> the, the Chinese companies uh, listed abroad. Uh, so I think people are doing more homework, are trying to be more careful and more responsible to their LPs. Uh, so that's a good thing, uh, a good sign for us as well. And Ben, you mentioned that your, your company just had a listing in London. And so I'm curious uh, the process in terms of why you guys chose London uh, and how that worked, especially now in a pandemic. Yeah, that was very extraordinary process. Um, there was a connect, uh, Shang London, Shanghai, London connect. And uh, Hua Tai Securities was the first firm listed in London using this GDR, this global uh, depository receipt that is linked to the A share traded in Shanghai. Then we decided to be uh, the second one. The project started, was uh, really initiated in September last year. Then we did some, a lot of preparation till, let me think, by the end of November, there was uh, this, this Hong Kong situation. Then there was a Brexit and there was uh, in January the, the, the outbreak of the pandemic. So everything was, was frozen. 
and then we got a green light all of a, all of a sudden on April 17th. Then we started preparing again with the new financial disclosures and all, every, all the new numbers. Then we did this uh, cloud cloud IPO. Really, the uh, we we did all the all the work in Shanghai, and the ceremony took place in Shanghai Stock Exchange. But then the stock was listed in London uh, on June 17th. So the whole work, uh, the two two uh, sets of uh, uh, perspectives, one in Chinese, one in English, and all the financial uh, financial statements, and uh, all the uh, road shows were done remotely uh, through the, uh, the, the the virtual conferences, and then uh, we listed this very successfully uh, in London. So the whole thing was done within within five months, and even the uh, the the investment bankers were really amazed by this. They said, "Okay, we've never seen the work." Uh, in this scale, this was the largest IPO uh, in London since 2015. And uh, uh, it, we created a lot of the first times, like first time using uh, the cloud business, uh, the cloud technologies, and then first time uh, this is the Chinese firm listed in London, a uh, 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 Chinese insurance firm. And the first time for a Chinese firm to use China accounting standard, you know, Baruch being a very famous a school in accounting. Uh, by the way, my wife is sitting beside me. She is accounting major from uh, Baruch uh, undergrad. Then, uh, so using Chinese uh, Chinese gap uh, accounting standard, this was the first time, and uh, that happened really quite dramatically. That happened after the locking coffee uh, thing, you know, which really tainted the, the reputation of Chinese companies. But uh, this insurance company that I work for, CPIC has built this reputation in London and uh, a great relationship with, with the, uh, the UK regulators, then uh, we are really trusted by the investors. So far, the stocks are trading pretty well. And uh, yeah, so that was a really, really interesting experience for me and for all of us who, who were engaged in this project. And uh, so from that moment on, we, we set a step uh, outside the, really outside the territory of Chinese uh, uh, sovereignty going into the Western market, and we're gonna draw uh, the, 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 the aim or objective is to draw more investors from the Western markets and to become our shareholders and to even sit on the board uh, of the directors. Yeah. Great, and Jane, uh, you mentioned how you had a great quote talking about all the different cities that you've lived in and, and worked in, and you talked about how you realize the world is flat. Uh, and so I, I'm curious professionally for you how the pandemic has impacted your day-to-day -day and what you do uh, for, at PwC. Well, for, you know, for my company, we help a lot of, a lot of uh, companies doing IPO as similar as Ben's companies as well. But the trend we see currently is there's less and less IPO to be happening in Hong Kong as well as the U.S. And more companies are planning to get listed in the domestic market. And even though a lot of companies structure, they usually have offshore structure, which is like Cayman, you know, Hong Kong and Wufi structures. And they are trying to uh, restructure their corporations and, you know, to fit in the Chinese market to get listed in China. Um, the industries uh, currently that we see, which is healthcare industry is the hardest area, you know, it, not because of the COVID-19, but even prior to COVID-19, there are still a lot of, uh, uh, you know, medicines, a lot of um, health care industry related uh, items that has already been uh, paying attention. So we see there's more and more opportunities on my clients who's in the health healthcare industry. And usually they got listed in, you know, in, in three different markets as well, US, Hong Kong, and, and, and China. But uh, I think Dion maybe knows more because the, the valuation in China is much more compared to other markets. So there's, you know, a lot of companies considering to be listed in, in China as well. Another industry that we see is the technology like Leslie's company. Uh, through the technology, there's a huge ecosystem because of uh, not only the pandemic, but, you know, health uh, technology helps people. It's convenient. It's, uh, it, it connects everyone around the world. But 
as mentioned, human being is a social animal. We cannot be quarantining ourselves in our room all the time. So uh, we do expect the traveling to be happening uh, more and more. And we do hope the door of the, each country can open shortly after you know, the control of this pandemic. Because um, like for me, my family is in Hong Kong, but I, I, I'm, unlike Ben, who can be quarantined for 14, four times, I haven't been traveling to Hong Kong for the past few months. And we, because we've been always hoping Hong Kong can release, you know, um, the, the traveling sooner and sooner. And we've been waiting months and months and months until now we give up because we don't see a, a, a good sign of a traveling among these two cities. But the, the, what I'm trying to say as well is um, there's things that we cannot expect in life. We, we do not expect this COVID-19 happening. We do not expect it lasts so long, not like the SARS in 2003, in which ends in the summertime. We've been praying that it could end shortly, but it doesn't seem to be leaving us anytime soon. So um, also, as Leslie mentioned, the war is the new, um, we have to live the war in a new blended way because um, uh, we have to fit into this culture uh, whether we can or we cannot travel. Uh, in my heart, I, I, I've always been thinking one day if uh, we can travel freely, it's a blessing. It's not, we shouldn't take it for granted. I totally agree with that for sure. Uh, I just want to remind everyone in this chat right now to, um, or sorry, in this in this video call that please put some questions in, in the group chat uh, on the right side of the Zoom here. Um, it would be great to hear from you. And I know a bunch have already come in. I just want to actually ask one, uh, Ethan Zhang asked, um, and I think Leslie, this is a good one for you. What's your view of getting a higher education online instead of going to campus? Um. I think there is no perfect answer, but everybody is trying to solve and find the ideal way that fits for themselves. But I think for most of us, we see a hybrid model, even though uh, mommydatemy.com is an online ed edge tech company that we do online platform. But even in the, in, in the past, we actually do work with some of our offline uh, partners, whether it's a campus and schools or a university or, or centers that they give uh, extension or immersion experiences. As Jane said, we are social beings. Um, sometimes I think there's a lot of uh, advantages for people to interact and uh, to actually touch things and uh, to see things right there, right, uh, right at that moment. And I think they, they need to experience that. So um, I think a hybrid is the new way to go. And then we obviously very much pay a lot of attention to the news right now uh, in the uh, US itself that school wants to be open or uh, asked to open and uh, what's the proper way to do so. I think it's, uh, it, we need a mixture. Um, sometimes there's a fatigue about purely online. Um, and I think there's a certain, um, like experiment. No, actually we, right now, one of our, our program we offer is online martial art. So historically people think, okay, is that possible? Like a physical education, how you can do that? Actually my own daughter in Hong Kong, so she attends a, a international Singapore school here. They actually, at the beginning was struggling. There's nothing offered online, but they figured out a way how to do the demo and, and the students actually practice right there, right then to do mixture. Now, uh, going back to Ethan's uh, question about higher education online instead of going, I think always you need kind of mixture. So, but the balance, the allocation of how much you do online, uh, giving the, you have a lot of uh, fact, factors to consider uh, with your geography location, the access to the campus and the, the resource you have and the safety to getting there. And I think now the ability to travel and, uh, and what's included in the online curriculum, because I think the world is now in a rush to turn the resource online, whether it's the curriculum material to digitalize it, or the, the teacher's readiness and the professor's readiness to be online. Uh, we've seen that in Hong Kong South, um, my own daughter's school, and also I see a lot of uh, students here in Asia now, they cannot travel back to UK 
or U.S. for education. Um, and I think a school is there for 100 years for a reason that uh, um, there's an in-person experience that doesn't matter. Um, I think uh, it's, uh, you know, like this EMBA program some of the top school offer where you do certain things because they value people's uh, time and efforts. So you could do some part of online, but I think it's a mixture of uh, extension, uh, offline, immersion, and uh, uh, social interaction. It's very important. And then so we need a kind of a ceremonial feel as well. <laughs> uh, this year I saw CNN has the special feature of an online graduation 2020 special class. This is something amazing, um, but to put a lot of efforts together. But I think it's, uh, we, we need to, at a certain point, I think uh, have that balance. Yeah, I think uh, school will exist. And I think it's just uh, turning to the new era of how to uh, accommodate and be uh, agile and reflect the, fact, the, the realities of the world is now crying out for this uh, mixture. I want to shift gears a little bit. I'm curious to get all of your thoughts on the uh, China implementing the national security law in security law in Hong Kong. And I'm curious, uh, from a professional standpoint, what are you advising your clients uh, with businesses in Hong Kong, uh, and what are you hearing from them uh, a after this leg legislation went through? And uh, Dion, I'd love to start with you. Um. <laughs> <laughs> Let me see. Um, honestly, I, I don't think I don't think it has a lot of impact in terms of uh, on the business side of my clients um, per se. I think um, I mean the riots, the protests. It's been going on for for uh, for for a while now. Um, I think the moment it started, um, the for, for for lack of a better word, um, I, I, I think the uh, the negative impact on Hong Kong has started. Uh, economically, uh, I think on, on, on you know for people that lives in Hong Kong, um, so this law, um, my pure personal opinion, um, I think uh, if it puts everything back, uh, you know uh, the way it was, or you know at least in a orderly fashion, um, it's a, it, it should be positive. It should be viewed as a, a, a positive change. Um, I mean, the alternative would be letting things go on forever with no end in sight. Um, I mean, I was, I was pretty much going to Hong Kong about twice every month um, before all the protests started. And then when the protests started, planes started to delay, couldn't get to the airport, um, couldn't, you know, couldn't hang out, uh, you, you know, in places where I used to go uh, without having to worry about some, you know, um, uh, rioters. Um, so, you know, in terms of businesses, I mean, a lot of our clients, uh, even Hong Kong clients, a lot of, a lot of them, you know, have businesses in China primarily, uh, and generate most of their revenues from China. Um, so, you know, Hong Kong, Hong Kong is important as a financial hub, but in terms of actual business, um, I, I will say 90% of my clients are not really impacted. Um, because for my hedge fund and private equity clients that are based in Hong Kong, they're investing in companies in mainland China primarily anyways. Um, so all of that is just, you know, it just makes life a little bit more inconvenient. Um, so hopefully, hopefully, um, you know, um, again, maybe this is coming from a military background, right? So I, I think people should just uh, fall in line, uh, do what they're told, <laughs> and get back, uh, get things back in order. Uh, ben, do you want to do you want to weigh in? Um, yeah, this is definitely a sensitive issue, but you know what I can share is I had multiple talks with my uh, my business counterparts, uh, Western banks, French banks, bankers, and the uh, uh, British bankers, and and, and the U.S. bankers. Most of the people would say the issue was overblown uh, to the extent that people thought this is like. Uh, a horrendous thing, but actually it doesn't really touch on the daily lives. Um, to me, you know, being, I, my home is in Flushing, New York, you know, of course this is the Chinatown, but I, 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 I'm, I consider myself a New York. Then in New York, we have more redlining than in Hong Kong. 
And actually, what I found funny was when I went back, came back to China to work at CPIC, I was more politically conscious than my colleagues. So my colleagues would say, <clears throat> oh, this is China, this is Hong Kong and Taiwan. These are mainland Chinese people, and some of them are you know, party members. I would say, no, 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 wait, wait, wait. When, when I was working at AIG, we never say these things. We say mainland China, Hong Kong, and Taiwan. So we want to be even more politically correct because we, don't, we didn't want to step into troubles. So you know, that's a sort of a half, half, half joke about it, but the, what I'm saying is um, it all, the, 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 the devil's is in the details. And uh, the national security law, the redlining, every country has its own redlining stuff. And uh, we, you know, there are certain parts we never want to touch or even get close to. But you know, those are the things that are so far away from daily lives. You do a business, you don't want to talk, you, know, you, you probably will never uh, uh, step into a political con confrontation uh, as a banker or as a small businessman because you, you're selling your, your stuff and uh, you know, just getting paid by these services or, 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 or product. And, uh, and uh, I think if this is executed correctly and executed diligently, um, it shouldn't really touch touch the daily lives of Hong Kong, uh, whether being a foreigner or local Hong Kong people. It really just to put up a an overarching, uh, uh, you know, a, a regulation on certain part of the country security, but not really about Hong Kong lives. Um, you know, I, I think over time, people will figure out and figure out. You know, that's the uh, the, the the new norm, the new normal, and. Uh, now, I, I don't think over 10 years or five years, this, this is going to be a big issue. Jane, what do you think? Well, I haven't been back to Hong Kong for the past five months. I wish I can go back and see what changed. And so far, among my friends, you know, when we are chatting, we don't see a, it does impact to our daily life. Uh, maybe on the a higher level, um, you know, on the political side, there might be some considerations, but from the normal daily life, we don't see a, a big change. And from on my clients as well, who has business in China, in Hong Kong, in other part of the world, um, we don't see there is a big impact from the security law, but we do see the impact because of the you know, freeze of traveling among countries. And, you know, cause I serve a high net worth clients and usually they wanna, you know, sh you know spread their net worth around the world uh, to, to get a balance. You know, some in China, some in Hong Kong, some in the US or other parts of the world. But now because of this uh, pandemic, it stops traveling. And even if you don't have that country's passport, let's say for example, you don't have a US passport or green card, you won't be able to get into the US because you cannot get a, get a visa to enter to the US. Likewise, you know, the, if you are a foreigner of China, you don't, you're, even though you have a visa, you may not be able to come back to China as well. So you see the country, the door of the, each country has closed. Even though, so, the, so my clients are start to worry, you know, if situation like this happening, uh, how are they going to have their asset protection? How are they going to have, have their uh, net worth being kept safe? Like, where do you move your assets around? Because um, as, as people know, you know, things happened in Hong Kong last year. A lot of people's, uh, you know, they, they, they opened their bank accounts in Singapore they shift their, their assets to Singapore from Hong Kong. So, you know, with all of these considerations, I think it really depends on, uh, the, on the, each individual's personal levels, how they view, where do they want to have their business with? Where do they want to live? Uh, usually, usually my, you know, my client or my friends will ask me, okay, you've been living in three countries, three, three places. Where do you want to live when you retire? And I said, I can live everywhere. I can stay in China for a few months, depends on the weather. I can be in New York as well, and I can be in Hong Kong. But 
Their second question is, well, until the day you cannot even walk, where would you live? So this is a good question. Like we thought we can travel all the time, but one day if you cannot travel, we have to think about it. Where do we want to stay? And Leslie, I'll turn it over to you. I actually uh, agree very much all the rest of the panelists. And I think uh, it's very well said. Um, I think uh, all of us, in particular, I think the, the people we speak today uh, come from very diverse background. Well, we love all these places. Um, we treat Hong Kong, New York, Shanghai, all these places uh, very emotionally than their homes. So we really want a, a homogenous a, a harmonious world. And I think Hong Kong historically has uh, achieved and also enjoy the long-standing reputation and the status being the, uh, the center of excellence and uh, the, the ability to attract a lot of talents. And I think the, that standard is not going away. Um, we, as, as Ben said, uh, I think it's more of a how details is going to be executed diligently uh, maybe we see uh, some, some impact in, in, in a few years, but for now, from the field that we actually are in, where is uh, online learning or, um, or financial investment, we haven't seen the uh, impact yet. And I, uh, we, we had a lot of discussion, and I think Hong Kong's status being the uh, gateway of the East and the West, the perfect combination. I think there's no other places we see that can take the place of Hong Kong so far. We, I, I lived in Singapore before. I mean, we, we lived in Singapore for a number of years. It's different. Singapore is more regional. Um, uh, where Hong Kong, I think, it really connects the East and the West and has the uh, uh, gateway to China. I think that's going to stay. And then if we expand this question a little bit more broadly, uh, obviously, US-China relations have, have been uh, deteriorating for, for quite some time now, for several years. And so uh, in that vein, I'm curious also uh, how that is impacting you all, both personally and, and professionally. Uh, ben, do you want to start with that one? Sorry. Um, really, Theon should answer that question first. He was in the army. Um, <laughs> but, you know, I... To put aside all the rhetoric, I think uh, the U.S. Secretary of Defense, Asper, said something very, I think, very good. He said he wants to travel to China to meet with Chinese officials, his counterparts in China, and to figure out where they can cooperate, where they can improve and enhance the communication. And he said, we want to openly compete with China. You know, that's a fair statement. I think it's a... Um, you know, we, we, I mentioned before, Steve, we, uh, you know, we, you're a journalist, I'm, I'm a half uh, historian. Uh, if we read history, this, uh, <clears throat> this thing happened multiple times in, in human cycles in history. So it's not, I, I think the whole, the macro grand cycle coincides with the uh, many things, but one, one particular reason I, will, I want to raise is is the aging of the baby boomers generation in the States. They were at the peak <clears throat> when 1971, uh, Nixon shock, Nixon gave the shock to the world with the de decoupling or depegging the dollar from the gold, and then the breaking down of the Bretton Woods currency system, everything. Uh, so, so the American dollar power has been rising to the peak together was the generation, was the baby boomer generation. And then this generation is aging, and by the time they are approaching the retirement age, they figured all of a sudden that they don't have full or sufficient savings for retirement. And then the job opportunities are taken away by technologies and by maybe you know some immigrants in certain, in certain fields. <clears throat> so now we have the situation of Donald Trump being the president, this, this is no coincidence, and uh, neither is the coincidence of the conflicts between China and, uh, and the U.S. So it's all 
Um, I, I think the relationship, or this is quite a, I can say bluntly, it's a, it's a common sense or a common understanding that the relationship will, will never return to what it was 20 years ago. But in China, as I can see in China, people don't really feel there is a, such a huge antagony or hatred or hostility between the two countries. You know, Chinese people, they, that appreciation of the U.S. Uh, uh, help during, you know, in history, back in history, you know, World War II and, and many times in history, and even during the uh, China-Soviet uh, Union and the China conflict was still very clearly remembered in China uh, and very frequently mentioned on, in, in the articles and the, in the, uh, on WeChat. So uh, I think there are complications and complicating factors by the election and by many things. Um, we'll have to see. And I think it's going to take a lot of wisdom and patience and uh, maybe Tai Chi. You know, it's, it's not, it's boxing versus Tai Chi. Use Tai Chi more. You know, uh, it's uh, people understand each other and people have um, uh, uh, empathy toward what, uh, <clears throat> toward what each other needs. I'm not saying this just in the, in, the, in, the, in empty words. I think China has been rising from a, a weak power or, or weakened power since 100 years ago to, to what it is today. And it's time to, for China to, to start understanding where America is. And uh, America is not the America 50 years ago. It's not the America 30 years ago. And uh, so there has, to, there, ha there has to be some real dialogue and the mutual dialogue happening between the two countries. And uh, uh, just to finish my, my brief thoughts, I, I gave a speech uh, back in 2016 <clears throat> in a China uh, insurance summit. And uh, so my, my, my anticipation was that if in the past cycle, in the past decade, it was China producing uh, American buying, and going forward in the next maybe 20 years or 30 years, it's going to be a mutual business. Some parts are being made in China, some parts are made in America, and some people are buying from China, and some people are buying from the U.S. So that'll make the, the globalization uh, really uh, uh, with more equity and equality. And, uh, but I think it's going to take a bumpy road to get, to get there and, to, and for people to really accept that relationship. And even both from Americans and Chinese. Chinese are, are learning how to become a uh, real world power, you know, just to, uh, for lack of a good word. But I think <clears throat> as long as we have the faith and we stick to the principle that there's uh, trying to avoid uh, a regrettable, any regrettable results or, 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 or uh, to avoid a, a, a uh, unintended consequences, That'll put both countries on a on a better stage. Yeah, thanks. Dion, what do you think? Um, I think I, you know. Obviously, I agree with everything Ben said. Um, I think you have um, two countries that are um, getting. Um, I think. Uh, well, I guess to simply put, I think I think China is closing the gap. Uh, in terms of, um, you know, I guess global leadership, if you will, um, and you have two very strong will uh, leaders uh, in these two countries, um, and and their style is not to shy away from each other. <laughs> their their style is probably, uh, you know, to to uh, to see who's got the you know uh, <laughs> bigger bigger um, bigger arm or bigger muscle. Um, so to, to see if this is going to, I guess, resolve uh, in a um, friendly or amicable manner, um, I think it'll benefit everyone. But what will it happen? I, I honestly don't know. Um, but do I think these two countries will ever, you know, engage into a more, I guess, into war? I, I, I doubt it. Um, so it'll just be trade wars. Uh, it'll just be a lot of politics. Um, I think business will suffer, uh, especially business with international uh, exposure. You know, Chinese company with a lot of U.S. exposure and 
you know, vice versa. Um, and it, it's probably going to go on until, um, you know, the U.S. election and then, you know, the change of leadership here in China. Um, I, 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 before then, uh, you probably won't see any changes. And Jane, how, how do you see the U.S.-China relations playing out in terms of your, uh, your professional career and what you're seeing in terms of what clients are saying, what are they doing, and how is this impacting them? Well, I think uh, everybody knows the conclusion that only uh, the U.S. and the China can collaborate. It will benefit the whole entire world. But that's the conclusion. But this is way not achieving uh, to that end of the tunnel. So currently, um, you know, especially if we see from the healthcare industry and because most of the uh, founders of the healthcare industry, they are all getting, most of them get their PhDs from the U.S. They being, you know, they study in the U.S., they work in the U.S., uh, and then they come back home to start, up, start their own, you know, R&D or start their own companies. And I think it's quite sensitive that the, the, the U.S. may think, you know, these PhDs, they steal the, the knowledge uh, from the U.S. and benefit uh, not the, the states anymore. Uh, so, because uh, one of my clients who is a PhD from the, from the, you know, one of the pri uh, privileged school in the States and back to, the, back to China to start his own company, he got visited by FBI twice because uh, they're trying to find out whether you know, he took any of the studies in the States back to China. So he, he said he didn't have anything to do with that. So therefore, there's, uh, you know, after the two visits from the FBI, he, he comes pretty clean. But you do see from the news that some of the um, professors or uh, scholars being, um, uh, you know, invited by the FBI and, and maybe trying to, um, you know, to, to understand whether they have shipped some of their knowledge outside of the States. So these are quite sensitive uh, things that we see in this industry. But honestly, uh, as an usual, uh, you know, people like me, because my, my daughter is studying college in the U.S. and she's, she's staying in Hong Kong right now, even though, you know, I can't believe we cannot see each other on this summer, <laughs> summertime. Uh, but uh, she planned to go back to the States uh, because uh, she was born there. Um, but she has some of her uh, colleagues, uh, uh, college students, his classmates, they are all from China. They, they cannot get their visa. They are prohibited from going to the U.S. to study, continuing their study. So they can only, you know, study online. But the Trump's policy is if you study online full time, then you won't be able to get your visa, you know, uh, F1 visa again. So there's a lot of turbulence in, in this um, student community that I think they are quite innocent. They're young and they're in the stage of trying to absorb knowledge. And, you know, U.S. is the best uh, ground for people to study. And of course, they can also contribute back to where they get their uh, education from. But now there's, because of the U.S.-China uh, tension relationship, it does hurt uh, the, the group of the students who are trying to pursue their their education. So this, this is something I think it's, it's a downside uh, to, you know, the, the group of populations. Yeah. But well, overall, okay. yeah. Thanks, Jane. Thank you. And uh, Leslie, I'll, I'll turn it over to you if you want to chime in on that, on that issue well, as well. Just, yeah, just very brief. And I think uh, our three panelists have so, said so well. And from um, my perspective, and I, I agree with Jane, uh, that uh, we actually previously organized some of the uh, summer tours or summer camps um, to US and the UK. Now, main reason is because pandemic that prevents our students or learners actually go for the offline immersion. Um, but the other reason now, obviously, there's uh, the confusion and tension. But I think from the, um, the education perspective, uh, 
we as a, I think the, the entire society, we share the same common value. We're uh, seeking for high ground of education and uh, seeking to improve and develop uh, the next generation. I think that's uh, across the board, all the societies. So uh, actually our platform now uh, focuses on uh, more of the, uh, uh, the two parts. So core discipline. Uh, subjects, so including the languages, including um, the math and and, and some science, um, with physics and chemistry uh, skills. Then the other is some of the soft skills, where people's ability and have the view of the global vision. And I think that although that now hit some of the road bumps and the hiccups somewhere with uh, two greatest uh, economy uh, not in a line. I hope we will, will sort it out. Uh, sooner than later. And I think it's, uh, it's uh, how we carry on what we can do uh, to continue to be the advocate of both side dialogue and the communication. And I think uh, in our education learning space is a good way to do it. And we see from the social and private level, people are still very eager to do that exchange and communication. So it's just finding the, the right way and channel to do it. I want to thank you all. This has been an absolutely fascinating conversation and uh, I have a couple questions to share uh, uh, share from our audience. Um, before I jump into that, uh, I do want to share that we have a new uh, Asian Heritage Alumni Network. I'm adding the LinkedIn uh, group uh, to the group chat uh, that has been recently launched. Uh, we also have an upcoming alumni event in uh, in Shanghai uh, that our new president, uh, Dr. David Wu, will be joining uh, virtually on uh, August 8th. And Ethan uh, Zeng, uh, who stewards our Shanghai Alumni Network, uh, will share some details about that event as well as the WeChat uh, for that group. Um, but first, uh, uh, I have a question about innovation um, for all of the panelists. Uh, can you give an example of um, an innovation that you have either witnessed um, uh, personally or professionally or a new habit that you envision uh, will now stick, a new way of doing things since the pandemic uh, began? Uh, and uh, Dion, why don't we start with you? Uh, it's definitely easy to, to go first. Uh, I would say, uh, uh, you know, uh, video based. I think we had a question on 5G. Um, I think the, uh, the biggest beneficiary uh, would be anyone who's in video based, AR, VR based, uh, via apps or, or programs or anything. Uh, we see at an industrial level, uh, you know, we, we, we have visited uh, factories where automation has been. Um, it just you don't even see that many people anymore um you got you got automated forklifts you got automated agv that's carrying boxes uh obviously the robotic arms um all of that um they need faster internet they need very very fast broadband uh, on your phone uh, i think leslie mentioned you know learning uh kung fu or karate on, on your phone uh, I, have a, I have a friend who uh, just started a company, I think similar to a company called Mirror, uh, that was recently acquired by, uh, I think, uh, Lululemon uh, in the States. Uh, the 3D sensing technology that's made possible by faster internet. Um, so anything that has to do, you know, that allows people to do things remotely, um, you know, that has to do with AR, VR, uh, 3D, uh, 3D sensing um, will, will be greatly uh, benefited obviously you know uh, what we're using now zoom uh, my client agora uh, all of these guys are definitely beneficiaries thank you jane well uh it's it could be an innovation from the structure perspective because our firm launched we flex last year in 2019 but we flex means we can work anywhere you know any place anytime so this is quite of a, a innovative, uh, you know, launch in China. I, I know, that like in the states, you can you have a lot of flexible working hours, and but in China, it's um, usually people still want to be punctual and to to work and and um, you know to see see you uh, 
to be there. But we launched WeFlex last year and we were being asked and doubted, how are you guys going to launch this WeFlex? Like, how do you know where these people are? Where are these people? Are they really working? Are they not working? Things like that. Well, <laughs> because of the, the, the program has already been there and uh, starting from uh, early this year, because of the pandemic, everybody works from home. So we suddenly, you know, we don't need a migration. It just happened that, you know, using the current technology, using, using a, a, a trustable uh, devices, then we, we launched this WeFlex with seamlessly. And we also launched a 200 people online, um, you know, um, workshop because we have like almost 200 people in China. So, so it, it requires a lot of technology to have all line styling at the same time. And because we've been always saying, oh, we are not a technology company and our technology actually is, is not as good as compared to the, the, a lot of companies. But because of the change of the world and you have to, you, you have to move with the, you move with the cheese. So, so this is a good thing that we see from our own firm that we are changing. That's, that's just fascinating. Uh, Leslie, where, where have you seen innovation at home, at work, out your window? Um, actually, well, the, the two parts. Number one, actually, we innovate every day, even today. <laughs> um, it, it's just something that keeps us very excited. Uh, to be at work and someone actually in the chat group saying, Leslie, you're still in your office nine o'clock. That was actually norm because we don't feel tired because we're compelled and then we felt the only enemy actually on our hand is the time. Time, we're running against the time. So today we did something like a small mini innovation, for example. So a Social Morning Post has a, it has the, a, a post for the younger populations. So they ask whether we can turn some of the text or that into something like elaborate words that you can pronounce, you can elaborate a grocery, and you can do some of exercise and let the kids to have a more in-depth, deep dive, understanding the grammar or that uh, English literacy. At first I said, okay, the team, what is possible to do? They said, give us two, two days. So tomorrow is a deadline and we finish it today. So things like that happens every day. So one is about how to utilize and uh, leverage uh, either our own creation or some existing technology to integrate, become a solution provider. I think our ability being now um, I'm an entrepreneur, startup person, is very different from um, in a bigger corporation where I have uh, tons of resources. Now it's actually become more self-initiated uh, that we find solution and that things, a lot of things we do every day never been done before. So it's a quite fascinating and I think keep us very passionate about. So that's one. Um, number two, it's about now looking at things, how to uh, address the need to, for a business model. So the one that I mentioned before is the, uh, the uh, actually eCamp. Uh, probably eCamp itself is not, uh, not new. Uh, Dion said before that we could do now Kung Fu, martial art, online, physical training, and um, we are offering music classes online with someone, a Broadway show performer. But the ability, I think it, we lose some kind of a touch with the cross-border interaction. So the online summer camp where we can bring the kids together. So imagine, actually, we have a, a user sign up from China, Hong Kong, Philippines, US, Europe, um, Vietnam, Bangladesh, they will be in the same classroom to watch live our London culture ambassador taking a walk on, around the, 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 the River Thames, the Buckingham Palace, and describe what is the, um, the status and the history and the food. This is something, it's a lot of work. So we worked actually throughout the day in the training our culture ambassadors a few hours ago. Then I said, oh, we have this uh, event tonight. I just, I, I feel full of excitement, wants to share and share with our fellow alumni. And I think this, you, you, we, uh, I, Baruch gave me a lot. And I, uh, last year, last, uh, last March, I was fortunate to attend the in-person uh, alumni events with Jeanette, with, uh, uh, with Lauren together. And I think we should continue that 
global co collaboration and the alumni support each other. And I think that gave me also the, the, uh, the feel of uh, confidence and want to do more. So if, if I may, I know that I saw our Shanghai uh, colleague or the, the alumni send the WeChat group of that. If I can, I want to share uh, the link, the website of a summer camp with the group, sure. just so that, uh, uh, and, and uh, please, um, we, we're happy. Uh, I think we have a, a, a promo code to uh, let uh, our alumni groups, anyone you have a kids or someone, teenager kids, or the young college students, welcome to join our live show. It's a live show, 40 minutes each for the cities. And I'm, um, yeah, we have a code to give it to you so you can catch group and cover the all. It's a free, completely free, our alumni. So let me write this uh, link. That's to very them. generous of you. Thank you so much, Leslie. And Bin, our historian, um, you've done a wonderful job sharing uh, a historic perspective. Uh, can you share with us some innovation that you have seen that you think will take hold uh, for the future, uh, either uh, personally or professionally or culturally? You know, I am in the least innovative industry, insurance. It's been around <laughs> 6,000 years. <laughs> As I'm getting older, I'm falling back to my, uh, to drinking this kind of thing. You know, uh, it's uh, <laughs> wine and doing my traditional Chinese poetry and calligraphy work. But I, I can, <clears throat> I do want to share one thing that I've recently seen that was so fascinating. In Shanghai, I visited, because I, I do investments. And I visited this, uh, a tiny small company that the uh, the two partners one was a Canadian I think Canadian and uh, the other one was a Chinese who studied in New York and later Canada <clears throat> they came back to Shanghai and they had this thing with the uh, a flyer or a, a, a newspaper you got the pictures on the newspaper and then once you put the phone facing that newspaper the people in the in the picture started moving around and, and the playing a drama or singing, uh, like re replay that video they recorded before. This is like halfway uh, a Harry Potter thing. Huh. That, was, that was amazing. You know, I was asking, I asked some, some experts, they said, okay, technically this is doable. And, uh, um, but to me, you know, to a layman like me, it was like, great, I'm gonna apply this to my sales, my insurance sales possibly. If, if you see an insurance policy with a photo or with some uh, uh, pictures and then you put your phone on that and the camera facing that, 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 that page, then people will start talking to you. And that, that was one particular case that really made my brain, you know, blow up, blown out. I was like, oh God, this is really happening. Um, there, there are many other things like VR, AR, uh, that's just way beyond my imagination. Uh, but what I'm trying to do today at my workplace is to say, is to create a culture and uh, an environment that young people who are, you know, my secretary is a young guy who studied in uh, 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 Brandeis University. And I was asking him, okay, uh, so what's the age of your parents? They go, same age as yours. I'm like, I'm, I'm getting so much old now. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, okay, so what I want to do is to create an environment that young people can can think freely and create freely. Um, yeah, so uh, that's just a bit of sharing. Again, unlike all these these uh, uh, marvelous alumni, they are in the in the frontier of creating things. I'm in the insurance guy. I'm doing the risk management for you for you. So uh, I'm the least innovative, but I want to be the cornerstone and anchor of your of your safetyness. That's wonderful. Thank you so much, Ben. Steve, you want to wrap things up? Uh, yeah, no, I just wanted to first just thank all the panelists for all your really, really excellent insights. It, uh, it's great to see everyone and it's great to learn from, from all of you. Uh, everyone has such really interesting and rich backgrounds and uh, careers and, and, you know, we're all living through these really difficult times right now, but I think it's just uh, it's really great to be able to come together in this virtual sense here and learn from each other and just really see how we're all coping and dealing with what's going on right now. So uh, I just wanted to thank everyone again. And um, Janet, did we want to do go like around round robin, have everyone do a closing statement? Is that yeah, okay? Yeah, that would be perfect. 
Okay, yeah, and if everyone just has anything else that they'd like to share, we could keep it brief. I think, you know, actually one thing that might be nice to do here is, uh, what is all of your favorite quarantine, what's your favorite quarantine activity that you've, you've learned to do over the, over the past several months that we've been in this situation? And, I, and let's start, uh, I'll start with Jane on this one. Well, um, I think it's finally have time to cook. And in, I also plant tomatoes, and there are two tomatoes harvest for the past three months. So that, that was my achievement uh, <laughs> during this quarantine period. But cooking is definitely something that you never had time to do, but you finally did it. We also planted tomatoes and my son absolutely <laughs> loves watching them grow. So it's been, <laughs> that's been great. Uh, Leslie, you want to go to you? Oh, yes. So I'm not a very good at cooking, but my daughter is. So I think I spent a lot of time and to do a, a assistant work for her. So she made a brownies and a, a cheesecake. Very nice, very tasty. I normally, I, I watch my diet. I don't want to put on weight, so I'm very careful. I'm not a dessert person, but what she makes is truly delicious. And she's a fan of uh, Gordon Ramsay's Master Chef Junior. And it gives us an, 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 actually aspiration that we actually invite some of the celebrity nutritionist uh, uh, person to teach a, a nutrition plus a cooking class. So she's from Chicago and often featured on the, on the news, the Windy City Live. So she's going to share that class with our uh, users, either in the US or in, um, in Asia. So yeah, so that's, uh, I think cooking will be the new, new uh, passion for us. Excellent. Uh, Dion? Sorry. Um, well, I, I learned I'm not uh, very good at many things. I, I bought a tennis racket. Uh, I probably played once during the entire pandemic. I bought a new basketball. I played, you know, not even once. Uh, I bought an air fryer, tried to cook because, uh, you know, delivery wasn't available for about a month. Uh, things didn't come out very well. So <laughs> tried a lot of things. Uh, nothing was really happening. If there's one thing that I did well was, uh, uh, you know, I learned how to run with a mask on. And I didn't think it was going to work out because, you know, it's the extra difficulty in terms of breathing. But, you know, I, I did it for about two kilometers. So it wasn't great, but at least I, at least I did it. Um, yeah. <laughs> Excellent. Thanks, Dion. And Ben? Um, yeah, actually, what I found interesting was during this time, I work longer. And uh, most of our, my colleagues are working longer. Because uh, since you're working home, you can have a conference call anytime during the day maybe 9 o'clock, 9.30, and, uh, um, but the, on the more uh, a, a, a happier side is I'm, I'm exhausting my inventory of this kind of thing very fast, <laughs> and I'm a big fan of whiskey. I think I'm going to be running short of whiskey soon, so <laughs> yeah, uh, but you know, I, hope, um, I, I, I do hope this pandemic will be over soon because um, Seeing everybody on the on the screen is nice, but I do like to talk to people in person. Well, thank, thank you. you very much, everyone, and Janet. Thank you for having me and thanking uh, and having us and and organizing all this. This was this was really great. Yes, that, thank you, thank you all. Thank you. Um, I I too have tried to grow tomato plants. It hasn't worked out well, but. Um, <laughs> But, I don't feel too bad anymore. <laughs> <laughs> so once again, this has been fascinating and uh, we're looking forward to having two more View from Abroad conversations, one with alumni in Brazil and one with uh, alumni in Korea in September. So please keep an eye out for the alumni calendar and uh, emails uh, announcing those events. Uh, we have a number of other events coming down the pike. We continue to have a career workshop series for those folks who um, have been downsized or furloughed or lost work um, due to the pandemic. Uh, and there are details about that on our, on our calendar uh, as well. Um, and 
Uh, as you've seen in the, uh, in the group chat, uh, there's the Shanghai event coming up on August 8th, and you can join the Shanghai uh, WeChat, uh, as well as our new Asian Heritage Alumni Network, uh, which is a, a global network. We launched uh, the network back in, in June and look forward to hosting uh, several events in the year ahead for alumni um, locally, nationally, and internationally. There are 180, uh, 160,000 alumni uh, of Baruch College around the world uh, in 113 countries. There's approximately 120,000 of them on LinkedIn. That is the place where we uh, connect and uh, truly is uh, our best database of where our alumni are. We recently launched a hashtag Hire Baruch initiative to uh, invite alumni to post positions and, uh, and share jobs uh, and project information with the college uh, to uh, employ current students, graduating students. And we hope you will also keep in mind uh, your fellow Baruch alumni when you are looking to hire talent, because the best way to support the college is to continue to hire the best and the brightest from Baruch College. So with that, I just say a huge thank you to everyone uh, for being with us today. Uh, to those uh, uh, in China, uh, wish you a wonderful evening. Those uh, closer to New York, I wish you a wonderful day. And we look forward to seeing you online again and indeed, Ben, back together in person again soon. Thank you thank all you. and have a great thank you night. All. Great night. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Yeah. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Great job, everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you.